Hello and welcome to this World Nuclear Association interview. My name is Jonathan Cobb. Today I'm pleased to be interviewing Dan Poneman, President and Chief Executive Officer of Centris Energy Corporation. In this series of interviews, we'll be looking at some of the issues that will be discussed at the World Nuclear Association Strategic E Forum, which will be taking place on the 9th, 10th, and 11th of September. To find out more about the, uh, that event, please go to www.worldnuclearforum.com. But for now, I'd like to introduce Dan Poneman. Dan, thanks very much for joining us. Delighted to be here. As we talk, the COVID-19 pandemic is still very much with us and governments are trying to put together recovery plans to reboost their economies, to generate jobs. But at the same time, the imperative to move towards a cleaner energy future is as strong as ever. So what is it that nuclear can offer to meet all these different challenges? Well, look, I'm glad you put that question, Jonathan, the way you did, because if there's one thing that COVID-19 tells us all, is that we have to be much more mindful of our infrastructures, much more mindful of supply chains, much more mindful of the resilience of our systems. And at this particularly dangerous time in the world, this is the time when nuclear really needs to come to the fore because nuclear has got so many things that the world needs. It's got clean power, it's got resilient power. We need each country around the world to look to its own capacity to satisfy their people's needs. And if we have a supply interruption when it comes to power, then everything else stops because electricity is the cornerstone of everything we do, whether it's in finance or hospital care or transportation. You can only imagine if the world ground to a halt because of electricity interruptions, it would be like COVID on steroids. And therefore, uh, nuclear, which has this beautiful van advantage of 724 capability of bringing the world carbon-free uh, power at a time when we need to completely decarbonize the power sector. As you know, all the scientists will tell us, electricity consumption will increase by 100% by 2050. By that time, if we wanna have a prayer of meeting Paris climate targets, we need to completely decarbonize the power sector, enter nuclear. Okay, so if nuclear offers all those benefits, what is it that government should be doing to help enable it to make the fullest contribution it can? Well, look, the first thing, I come from the Department of Energy, I spent many years there. We believe in facts and science. The first thing is you just gotta do the math. And what governments need to do is recognize that their stated targets of preventing catastrophic climate change depend no matter whether you ask the International Energy Agency or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, on a significant expansion of nuclear. That recognition is step one. Step two, what do you do about that? Well, I can't speak to every country, but in many countries, and certainly in the United States, nuclear is not recognized by the market for its unique attributes. I'll mention two. One, it's carbon-free power generation. It's 20% of US power generation, but over 50% of carbon-free power generation. Number two, it's always on. If you look at hurricanes uh, in the uh, southwest of the United States, uh, the, the Houston experience we had, hurricanes, uh, if you look at the polar vortex we had in the upper Midwest in, in 2014, when other things shut down, nuclear kept going. So resilience is so important and that is a key attribute. And markets don't value that when it comes to nuclear. So whether it's through some form of carbon pricing or capacity markets or reform of the regulatory uh, system in which nuclear is disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis other forms of power, governments need to remove those impediments on the one hand and value the attributes that nuclear brings to the fore. If nuclear would be able to be recognized for the attributes it already has intrinsically, it would be much more competitive and we'd see the kind of expansion of nuclear that I think we really need to, both for the resilience of the grid and for our climate objectives. Right, and is there anything specific to nuclear fuels, whether for existing reactors or looking at advanced reactors, SMRs? Is there something that governments should be doing in that area? Well, yes, uh, Jonathan, I'm glad you asked. It's, it's an interesting thing. Sometimes it's a little strange, candidly speaking, when you hear this bow wave of enthusiasm for advanced reactors, it seems as though people think they'll run on air because no one seems to ever want to talk about the fuel. 
But the fact of the matter is we need new fuels to support these advanced reactors. As I'm sure you know, the advanced reactors that use different kinds of coolants from the traditional light water reactors, those that use uh, the gas cooled reactors or uh, metal cooled reactors or molten salt reactors, most of them require this new kind of fuel we we'll call high assay low enriched uranium, not the LEU that we're familiar with from the light water reactors of current uh, generations, but the reactors that will need fuel between 5 and 20 percent high assay low enriched uranium. There are regulatory and other steps that need to be taken to bring that kind of uh, fuel to market. We're very proud at Centris, for example, that with uh, contract support from the U.S. Department of Energy on an 80-20 cost share basis, we are developing a small cascade of 16 machines of advanced centrifuges in our plant in Piketon, Ohio. By 2022, we will have a Nuclear Regulatory Commission to be producing that kind of 19.75% fuel. But that's only the first step. We need to take, obviously, that demonstration cascade and expand it to support the kind of build-out of advanced nuclear power, which we need to see if, again, we're going to meet the world's climate and resilience targets. That's interesting. You, you're pointing out one thing that Centris is doing, um, but is there something that the nuclear industry as a whole should be doing? If we get that government support, what do we need to do as an industry to maximize our potential? Well, what we need to do, I think, is to concert our efforts better. You know, there's a famous line about, uh, I think, from Mao that talks about letting 100 flowers bloom, and that's all well and good. But if each flower had its own separate unique requirement for fuel supplies, you might never get one. So what we really need to do as an industry, Jonathan, is pool all of the different buckets of demand from the commercial sector. And I might add, we should also pool demand, which there is from the government side of the equation. And if you pooled all that demand, then you get a sufficient demand signal with the kind of uh, revenues that would come from the sale of uh, that high assay loan uranium over time that would allow the investment to take place that would be needed to expand it. So I would say the key thing that the industry needs to do is to uh, collect its efforts in a coherent strategy. And just as they've done, for example, when it comes to advanced reactors, where they end up getting very strong bipartisan legislation passed in the US Congre uh, Congress, which is now supporting this very exciting advanced reactor development program that the Department of Energy is running, they need to do the same thing for fuel. Because as one of the advanced reactor developers told me, it's a very hard business case to make when I can tell my customer, I've got a great reactor for you. I only wish I could fuel it. Right. Um, and on that issue, one of the issues that we'll be discussing at the Strategic E Forum uh, will be cost, and we'll also be discussing finance of new projects, new build. So, what is it that the industry needs to be doing, or perhaps governments need to be doing uh, on those two areas? Well, look, I think a lot of that falls to industry because uh, clearly uh, for all of the challenges that nuclear faces, cost is a huge one. And there's a lot of exciting work that's going on with um, artificial intelligence use uh, in, in designing these new reactors and 3D manufacturing and so forth. So the, the, the industry, and this applies both to reactors and to fuel, need to really take a page from so many other industries that have dramatically cut costs. We can do it. It's not beyond the wit of the talented uh, men and women in this industry uh, to come up with those kind of new technologies. So A, we've got to cut costs. B, we do need help from government because some of what happens is obviously the uh, regulatory burden that is uh, so extensive with nuclear sometimes goes uh, overboard and uh, does more than it needs to do. And if you go we all need to be safe. We all know that. But if you go too far in red tape and things that aren't really productive in terms of uh, advancing safety, but just kind of bog things down, that's going to be a cost uh, problem uh, as well. On the other side of your question, finance, look, there are mechanisms to, to finance this thing. If we got enough reactor orders, you could do a classic kind of a project finance approach where you take a long-term power purchasing agreement and then that stream of revenues could securitize uh, commercial finance and could inspire equity contributions as well. And in this respect, I would just note that uh, that kind of uh, finance is enhanced when you do have government support for that. I was privileged to chair for five and a half years the Credit Review Board at the U.S. Department of Energy, and that 
uh, uh, loan guarantee program put out $30 billion of loan guarantees. It started the whole utility scale solar photovoltaic industry in the United States of America. There was not a single grid scale solar PV plant. We built five and then the commercial market took over. We supported Project Vogel as well. And, and those kinds of loan guarantees do a couple of important things, Jonathan. Number one, commercial financiers don't like technical risk. And the people inside the US Department of Energy have the technical competence to make judgments on the technical risk that any particular technology may have. That gives confidence to the private sector to invest. And obviously, when you have government finance and the full faith and credit of the Treasury standing behind a loan guarantee, that dramatically reduces the risks and therefore the borrowing costs uh, that uh, must be paid in order to support these plants. And since they're very expensive, saving on financing costs is hugely important to making them competitive. So if governments do the, all that we think they need to do, if the industry does everything it needs to do to deliver on its full potential, what's your vision of the future? What is your vision of success? My vision of success really is very much inspired by what's happening out there in the development of fourth generation nuclear power. Uh, the small modular reactors in general and these uh, advanced technologies that use different forms of coolant that have inherent safety features that uh, can be built smaller, better, faster, cheaper. It's super exciting to me. And, uh, you know, I should note, uh, not only is the U.S. Department of Energy supporting the, the construction of two advanced re uh, reactors in a demonstration program that uh, they are now just competing among all the bidding uh, applications, but also the Pentagon is taking a very close look at micro nuclear power plants of between one and 10 megawatts. They've given out three contracts to companies to develop designs. They intend to down the prototype. That could be the beginning of a whole new wave of very small reactors that could be de deployed in remote island locations, in remote mining locations, in places that uh, diesel can't easily get to. And so I, my vision is a world of hundreds of these reactors deployed globally, uh, spewing out uh, carbon-free energy, not only pro providing uh, electricity for uh, power generation, but providing heat for industrial processes, even district heating. There's so many opportunities once we bend the curve on this and get these things deployed widely. And I think as we go into that, you're gonna regain the public confidence. That's what we need to do. And, and one of the many, many attributes of Gen 4 reactors that I like is that they do have the ability to help rebrand our industry, which we must do post Fukushima. And really when people understand the tremendous benefits that come with nuclear and how safe and how clean it is, I think you see a, a chance, a chance of bending the curve on climate change. I'm haunted by the IPCC report that talked about the dreadful things that could happen even at two degrees centigrade if we succeed in achieving a limitation of temperature rise to two, degree, two degrees centigrade over pre-industrial levels, you'll still lose 99% of the coral reefs by 2050 and, and perhaps all of the Arctic ice uh, at the North Pole. So we really gotta go for 1.5 degrees centigrade. You just don't get there without a lot more nuclear and so that's my vision of the future. Dan Poneman, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. That Jeremy. concludes today's interview. But for, to find out more interviews and to find more about the World Nuclear Association Strategic E-Forum, please go to www.worldnuclearforum.com, where you'll find out more information, including how to register for the webinars for free. But for today, thank you very much for joining us and goodbye.